Part 6 of This is the End by Stella Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Next day, all the family, including Mr. Russell, and excepting Cousin Gustus, came to breakfast with the intention of announcing that he or she must go up to London by the next train. Mrs. Gustus, as ever, spoke first. My conscience is pricking me. My work is calling me. I must go up and see my old darlings in the brown burrow. There is, I see, a train at ten. I was just going to say something quite different to the same effect, said Q. I want to go up and whisper some secrets into the ear of Cox. I want to have my hair cut. I want to buy this week's punch. I want some brown boot laces. Life is empty for me, unless I go up to town this morning. Mr. Russell, although he had tried the effect of all his excuses on his hound while dressing, was silent. Mrs. Gustus was never less than half an hour too early for trains. This might account for the excellence of her general information. She had spent a large portion of her life at railway stations, which are, I think, the center of much wisdom. She and Q started for the station, with mouths burnt by hurried coffee, and toast crumbs still unbrushed on their waistcoats, forty minutes before the train was due. The protests of Q could be heard almost as far as the station, which was reached by a walk of five minutes. Cousin Gustus, Mr. Russell, and the convalescent hound went to lie upon the downs, which climbed up straight from the back doorstep of the inn. They were accompanied by a rug, a scarf, a sunshade, an overcoat, the blessings of the landlady, and Cousin Gustus's diary. Nobody ever knew what sort of matter filled Cousin Gustus's diary. Nobody ever wanted to know. It gave him grounds for claiming literary tastes, and his literary tastes presumably made him marry a literary wife. So the diary had a certain importance. They spread out the rug in a little hollow, like a giant's footprint in the downs, and sheep and various small flowers looked over their shoulders. For the first ten minutes, Mr. Russell lay on his back, listening to the busy sound of the bees filling their honey bags, and the sheep filling themselves, and Cousin Gustus filling his diary. He watched the rooks travel across the varied country of the sky. He watched a little black and white bird that danced in the air to the tune of its own very high and flippant song. He watched the sun ford a deep and foaming cloud. And all the time he remembered many reasons why it would have been nice to go up to London. Oddly enough, a bus conductor seemed to stand quite apart from these reasons in the back of his mind for several minutes. One would hardly have believed that a bus conductor could have held her own so long in the mind of a person like Mr. Russell. And Providence finally ordained that he should feel in his cigarette case and find it empty. No cigarettes, said Mr. Russell, after pondering for a moment on this disappointment. You smoke too much, said Cousin Gustus. I once knew a man who oversmoked all his life, and when he got a bullet in his lung in the Zulu War he died, simply as the result of his foolishness. No recuperative power. They said his lungs were simply leather. Should have thought that would have been a protection said Mr. Russell. "'The train is not even signaled yet,' said Cousin Gustus. "'You would have time to go to the station and tell Q to get you some cigarettes.' But this was not Providence's intention, as interpreted by Mr. Russell. "'Do you know? I half believe I'll go up too,' he said. "'Would you be lonely?' "'Not in the least,' said Cousin Gustus pathetically. I'm used to being left alone. As the signals dropped, 
Mr. Russell sprang to his feet and ran down the slope. He had country clothes on, and some thistle-down and a sprig or two of clover were sticking to them. He reached the station in time, and fell over a crate of hens. The hens were furious about it and said so. Mr. Russell said nothing, but he felt hurt when the porter who opened the door for him asked if the hens were his. After the train had started, he wished he had had time to tell the porter how impossible it was that a man who owned a crate full of hens should fall over it, and then he thought that would have been neither witty nor convincing. He was one of those lucky people who say so little that they rarely have need to regret what they have said. The business that dragged him so precipitately from the country must, I suppose, have been very urgent. It chanced that it lay at Ludgate Circus, and it also chanced, not in the least unnaturally, that at half-past eleven he was standing at Kensington Church, waiting to be beckoned to once more by a bus conductor. The only unnatural thing was that several buses bound for Ludgate Circus passed without winning the patronage of Mr. Russell. The conductor came. Mr. Russell saw her round face and squared hair appear out of the confusion of the street. He noticed with surprise that he had not borne in mind the pleasing way in which the strap of her hat tilted her already tilted chin. Jay had been thinking a little about Mr. Russell, not much. She had been wondering who he was. The family's friends and relations were always much talked of in the family, and much invited and much met. Mr. Russell had not been among them when Jay had last known the family. An idea was in her mind that he might be a private detective, engaged by the family to seek out their fugitive young relation. Mr. Russell had plainly alluded to a search. Jay had no experience of private detectives, but she thought it quite possible that they might disguise themselves with rather low foreheads and rather frowning eyes, and shut thin mouths and shut thin expressions. She hoped that she would see him today. An hour ago, a young man with a spotty complexion and bulging eyes like a rabbit's had handed her a note with his threepence, asking for a two and a half in a lovelorn voice. She handed him back his halfpenny and his unopened note at once, saying, Your change, sir, in a kind, absent-minded voice. I am afraid an incident like this is always a little exciting, though I admit it ought to be insulting. That suggestive fare made Jay hope more and more that she would meet Mr. Russell today. I don't exactly know why, except that sentimentality is an infectious complaint. Mr. Russell got happily into the bus. He made the worst entrance possible. His hat slipped crooked, he left one leg behind on the road, and only retrieved it with the help of the conductor. Jay welcomed him with a nod that was almost a bow, a remnant of her unprofessional past. "'Told you I'd come in this bus again,' said Mr. Russell, sitting down in the left-hand seat next to the door. "'I really don't know what would have happened if that seat had been occupied. I suppose Mr. Russell would have sat upon the occupier.' "'A good many people like the service,' said Jay. "'It is considered very convenient. How is your search going?' "'It hasn't begun yet,' said Mr. Russell. We haven't got within three hundred miles of the house we're looking for. You know more or less where it is, then? asked Jay, who sometimes wanted to know this herself. I do know, but I don't know how I know, nor what I know. How funny that you, an older and wiser man, should feel that sort of knowledge, said Jay. As an afterthought, she called him Sir. The bus grew fuller, and only Jay's bell punctured the silence that followed. A lady asked Jay to 
set her down at Charing Cross Post Office. The bus stops there automatically, madam, said Jay, and the lady told her not to be impertinent. Jay seemed a little subdued after this, and it was only after she had stood for a minute or two on her platform in silence that she said to Mr. Russell, London seems dead today, doesn't it? Not even fog, only a lifeless light. What's the use of daylight in London today? You know, I don't live in London. No, said Mr. Russell. Where do you live? London, replied Jay. I mean, my heart doesn't live in London mostly. I think it lives very far away, in the same sort of place as the place you know without knowing how you know it. The happy shore of God knows where must have a great population of hearts. Today I hate London so that I could tear it into pieces like a rag. You ought to start your bus on the search for the happy shore, said Mr. Russell. You'd find the track of my tires before you. I believe you'd find the place. Well, that would be the only perfect service, said Jay but I don't believe the public would use the route much. I would go on and on, and leave all old ruts behind. I would stop for no fares, even the sea should not stop me. I would go on to the horizon, to see if that secret look just after sunset really means that the stars are just over the brink. Why do people end themselves on a note of despair? I would choose that way of perpetuating my perfect day. The police would see the top seats of the bus sticking out at low tide, and the verdict would be suicide, well, of even more than usually unsound mind. A bus has an unromantic voice. The bass is a snarl, and the treble is made up of a shrill rattle. It was curious how this bus managed to retain withal its fantastic atmosphere. Mr. Russell asked presently, Why are you a bus conductor? To get some money, replied the conductor baldly. I want to find out what is the attraction of money. Besides, if one talks such a lot as I do, to do anything, however small, saves one from being utterly futile. When I get to heaven, the angels won't be able to say, Tush, tush, you lived on the charity of God. That's what unearned money is, isn't it? And what's the use of charity? Do you ever get a day off? asked Mr. Russell. Occasionally. Will you meet me on the steps of St. Paul's next Sunday at ten? No, because I shall be at work next Sunday. Will you meet me the Sunday after that? Yes, said Jay. The family's theories on the bringing up of girls had evidently been wasted on her. What's the use of looking for this girl? she asked, after a round of duty. Why not leave her on her happy shore? Do you know, sir, I sympathize enormously with that girl. I don't expect you would if you knew her said Mr. Russell. She must be quite different from you by what I hear from her relations. I think she must be an aggressive, suffragette sort of girl. Girls nowadays seem to find running away from home a sufficient profession. You say that because you are so dreadfully much older and wiser, said Jay. Why are you looking for her then? I'm not, said Mr. Russell. She is just a trespasser. I'm looking for the place because I know I know it. I hope you'll never find it, said Jay crossly. She announced Ludgate Circus in a startling voice, and ended the conversation. She was tired because she had been up all night among distressed friends in the brown borough. There had been a fight in Tan Street. Mrs. O'Rourke had broken the face of little Mrs. Love. Mrs. Love had never fought before. Her fists were like lamb cutlets, and she had had a good mother with non-combatant principles. All these things are drawbacks in a Brown Borough argument. But Mrs. Love was a friend of Jay's, 
and I don't think she had found that a drawback. Feverish discussions with dreadfully impartial policemen, feverish drying of feverish tears, feverish extracting of medicaments from closed chemists, and finally a feverish triumph of words, with which Jay capped Mrs. O'Rourke's triumph of fists, were the items in the sum of a feverish night. So Jay was tired. Mr. Russell was too early for his business, and he went into St. Paul's and sat on a seat far back. St. Paul was an anti-saint, I think, who very badly needed to get married and be answered back now and then. I believe it is possible that he was unworthy of that great house called by his name. The gospel of a very splendid detachment speaks within its walls. Its windows turn inward. Its music sings to itself. Tossed city sinners go in and out and pass and penetrate, but still the music dreams, and still the dim gold blinks above their heads. A muffled god walks the aisles, and you, in the bristling wilderness of chairs, can clutch at his skirts and never see his eyes. Nothing comes forward from that altar to meet you. It is as if he walked talking to himself, and as if even his speech were lost in those devouring spaces. Mr. Russell sat near the door, and found only his thoughts and the shuffle of seeking feet to keep him company. An older and wiser man, he thought. God forgive me for letting it pass. If he had thought it worth while to profess an ism at all, he would have been a fatalist. He was the victim of an unwitty cynicism and of a heavy irresponsibility. He applied either, It isn't worth while, or It doesn't matter, to everything. He never expressed his thoughts to himself. It was not worth while. But I think he knew within himself that life was made of paper and thrown together in a crackling chaos. There was no depth in anything, and a mere thought could slay the highest thing in the world. The only thing that ever made his heart laugh was the idea of fineness finding place in himself. A dream of himself in a heroic light sometimes made him poke himself in the ribs and mock the farce of human vanity. He was like a man in a world that lacked mirrors, a man who sees his dark deformed shadow on the sands and thinks it represents him fairly. He was without self-consciousness, knowing that he was not worth his own recognition. At home he often recited little confused poems of his own composition to his hound, and never noticed the surprise of the servants. He never knew that in the company of Mr. and Mrs. Gustus and Q he was hardly allowed to utter three consecutive words, although when he was away from them, and especially when he was with the bus conductor, he felt a delightful lack of restraint. As he sat down and looked at the far unanswering altar, he had two dim thoughts. One was that a man might get older and wiser without getting old enough or wise enough to choose his road. The other was a question as to whether it is ever really worthwhile to read what the signpost says. From the moment when Mr. Russell left her bus, Jay became stupefied by an invasion of the secret world. She gave the tickets and change with accuracy. She kept count of the stream of climbers onto the top of the bus. She stilled the angry whirlpool of people on the pavement for whom there was no room. She dislodged passengers at the corners of their own streets. Even that gentleman almost always to be found in an obscure corner of an east-going bus, who had sunk into a sudden and pathetic sleep just when his pennyworth of ride was coming to an end. 
she received an unexpected inspector with the smile that comes of knowing every passenger to be properly ticketed. She even laughed at his joke. She weeded out the Whitechapel Jewesses at the bank and introduced them to the Mile End buses. She handed out to them their somber and insolent-looking babies, and when one mother thanked her profusely in Yiddish, she replied, Bitte, bitte. Yet all the while the wind blew to her old remembrances of the low chimneys and the bending roofs of the house by the sea, and the smell of the high curving fields and the shouting of the sea. And all the while her hands must grope for the handle of the heavy door, and her eyes must fill with blindness because of the wonderful promise of distant cliffs with the sun on them, and because the sea was so shining and all the while her ears must strain to hear a voice within the house. It is a very great honor to be given two lives to live. The monotonous journeys trod on each other's heels. Slowly the day consumed itself. It grew dimmer and dimmer for Jay, though I have no doubt that habit protected her, and that she behaved herself throughout with commonplace correctness. She found presently that the great weight of copper money was gone from her shoulder, and that it was evening, and that Chloris was coming down Mabel Place to meet her. Chloris was wagging her whole person from the shoulder-blades backwards. She never found adequate the tail that had originally been provided for that purpose. Jay stumbled up the step of eighteen Mabel Place, and found at last the path she wanted. The path was one that had never been touched by a professional pathmaker. Feet, not hands, had made it. The rocks impatiently thrust it aside every little way, and here and there were steps up and down, for no reason except that the rock would have it so. The path chose its way, so that you might see the sea from every inch of it. The thundering headlands sprang from Jay's left hand, and she could see the cliffs ridden over with strange lines, and the shadow that they cast upon deep water. It was the color of a great passion, and against that color pink foxgloves bowed dramatically upon the fringe of space. The white gulls were in the valleys of the sea. I wish color could be built by words. I wish I could speak color to myself in the dark. I can never fill my eyes full enough of the color of the sea, nor my ears of the crying of the seagulls. I am most greedy of these things, and take no thought for the morrow, so that if my morrow dawns darkly, I have nothing stored away to comfort me. The path joins the more civilized road, almost at the door of the house by the sea. You tumble over a great round rock that still bears the marks of the sea's fingers, and you are at the door. The house was full of sunlight. Great panels of sunlight lay across the air. The fingers of the honeysuckle in the rough-painted bowl by the window caught and held sunlight. In every room of the house you can always hear the eternal march of the sea up and down the shore. Nothing ever drowns that measured confusion. Sometimes the voices of friends thread in and out of it, sometimes the dogs bark, or a coming meal clinks in the stone passage, or you can catch the squealing of the children in their baths. Sometimes your heart stops beating to listen to the speech of the ghosts that haunt the house but no sound ever usurps the throne of the sea. They were all on the stairs, the secret friend and the children. They all wore untidy clothes, and hard-boiled eggs bulged from their pockets. The secret friend has red hair, you might call his color vulgar, but Jay likes it very much. He hardly ever sits still, you can never see him think, he has a way of answering you almost before you have finished speaking. 
his mind always seems to be exploring among words, and sometimes you can hear him telling himself splendid sentences without meaning. For this reason, everything connected with him has a name, from his dog, which is called Trelawney, to the last cigarette he smokes at night, which is called Isabel. This trick Jay has imported into her own establishment. She has an umbrella called MacDonald, and a little occasional pleurisy pain under one rib, which she introduces to the family as Julia. The children in the house were just those very children that every woman hopes, or has hoped, to have for her own. They were just starting for a walk, and the secret friend was finishing a story. How can you remember things that happened, I suppose, squillions of years ago? said the eldest child. You tell them as if they happened yesterday. Doesn't it seem as if all the happiest things happened yesterday? To me it seems that they will happen tomorrow, said the secret friend. But then there is so little difference between yesterday and tomorrow. How can you tell which is which? Only clocks and calendars are silly enough to tread on the tail of a little space between sunrise and sunset and call it today. How do you know which way up time is happening? Because yesterday the sun set and we went to bed, said the youngest child. I think tomorrow is a little person in dark clothes watching and listening, said the eldest child. And today is Cinderella, all shiny and beautiful, until twelve o'clock strikes. All yesterdays and all tomorrows are in this house listening, said the secret friend. This is the place where time is without a name. Here the beginning comes after the end. Tomorrow we shall be born. Yesterday we died. Today was just a little passage built of twenty-four odd hours. And now we will sing the loud song. They were on the rocky path now, and they sang the loud song. Both that path and that song go on forever, and the words of the song are like this. There is no house like our house, even in heaven. There is no family like our family, even in heaven. There is no country like our country, even in heaven. There is no sea like our sea, even in heaven. Most families sing this song, more or less, but few could sing it so loudly as this family did. The dog Trelawney ran after the shadows of the seagulls. There is the track my feet have worn, by which my fate may find me. From that dim place where I was born, those footprints run behind me. Uncertain was the trail I left, for, oh, the way was stormy. But now this splendid sea has cleft my journey from before me. Three things the sea shall never end, Three things shall mock its power, My singing soul, my secret friend, And this my perfect hour. And you shall seek me till you reach The tangled tide advancing, And you shall find upon the beach The traces of my dancing, And in the air the happy speech Of secret friends romancing. End of part six.